Without further ado, again, I introduce you to Dr. Emmanuel Afori and Dr. Beatrice Cano. I'm very proud to have you here, all right? Wonderful. Thank thanks for having us. So, you can start. All right, uh, thanks, Gus, for inviting us back to uh, AUC. Uh, I know I speak to, I speak for myself and Beatrice, Dr. Cano, that we're very delighted when the invitation came to have the opportunity to come back to the island to see where literally our, our dreams of becoming doctors were started. Um, I know Gus uh, gave us uh, an invitation to speak to uh, mainly uh, current students and to basically share with you our stories of how we, we ended up where we are. Uh, by no means are our stories very uh, unique. Uh, it's just one of many stories. Uh, I know I speak for myself and my colleagues because uh, we are all very successful doing uh, our various specialties, uh, doing whatever we're doing. So uh, I'll start off by telling you guys a little bit about myself. My name is Manuel Lafori. I'm currently uh, the Chief Gastroenterolo Gastroenterology Fellow at uh, the Brooklyn Hospital Center in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Um, basically, uh, I'm originally from Ghana. I came to the United States at the age of 16 uh, in, in 2002. And pretty much I've been in schooling uh, ever since. Uh, I uh, went on to Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio for my undergrad. And uh, pretty much ended up at AUC, uh, the class uh, starting in the fall of 20, 2008. Uh, since then, uh, I pretty much have uh, gone through the various years throughout my medical training. I ended up uh, going to New York City to basically do my clinical rotations. And I'll speak more as the, the talk goes on about my experience uh, throughout rotations and all that, and how I ultimately ended up uh, in the field of gastroenterology. Um, so b throughout, I also went on to do internal medicine uh, residency at Brooklyn Hospital, again in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I was a fourth year chief, med uh, chief uh, internal medicine chief resident. And also uh, stayed on for gastroenterology general uh, gastroenterology fellowship, of which I'm currently completing, and uh, will go on next year uh, to the University of Maryland to do my advanced uh, gastroenterology uh, fellowship training. So I think I'll give the mic back to Dr. Canal to also tell us a little bit about herself. Thanks, Yvonne. Yes, yeah, so I'm Beatrice Canal, and uh, currently I um, work at the Ohio State University as a rheumatology staff and uh, assistant professor of clinical medicine as well. But I started at the same class as Iman in September of 2008 um, here, but I'll tell you a little bit about myself too. Uh, I was born and raised in Haiti and uh, lived there until I was 16, and then I moved to Canada, uh, to Montreal, and I went to McGill University for undergrad and then moved uh, to St. Martin to start medical school in September 2008. And also we'll go through the uh, details of, of the core rotations and how uh, we went through basic sciences. But I did my rotations in various places, including New York and uh, the UK, which I enjoyed very much. And also uh, then matched into internal medicine in California at uh, University of Southern California, which I uh, completed my internal medicine residency and also stayed there for uh, to match into the rheumatology fellowship uh, at USC as well. And then uh, over a year ago, I moved to Columbus, Ohio, where I now work at the OSU uh, in the rheumatology division. So, uh, yeah, so I know Gus has some questions for us um, based on what you guys want to know about our, our, career, our career path and how we uh, went through uh, basic sciences and, and rotation. So I think this is a good time maybe to start answering some of the questions. Sure. So... Um in, pre in prepping for the talk, I think uh, our host, uh, Gus, was very kind to give us some questions that some of you students may be thinking about and would want us to answer. So I'm just going to uh, read off a couple and a few and uh, have us respond to it. Hopefully, they are very helpful to you guys as students. Um, how was your clinical science experience like uh, during your training? Okay, so first I'll just address the basic science part and just start by saying that uh, I felt very prepared 
uh, by all the basic science classes uh, while on the island. And I know it's kind of overwhelming to think about all this, uh, all these details and all the different options that we have and what to think about. But I would just start by saying that while you're on the island in basic sciences, enjoy your time here. It's a beautiful island. And also, uh, we have a lot of support to understand medicine, get excited about medicine, and try to find out what you like and uh, other things, and find out what you don't like as well is as important. But also, staying open and, and finding that out, I think, is the best uh, advice that I could give you for starting off in basic sciences. But um, work hard, and uh, by the time you get to the rotations, then you'll have some basis of knowledge for uh, on which to build upon and learn from actual patients. And you'll realize that all the knowledge that you've got here only makes sense if you see the patients there. And you'll, you, you'll learn more on rotations for sure. So I started uh, in New York. And I did uh, my family rotation at Bronx Lebanon um, Hospital. And then uh, that was great as well. But uh, I did the rest of my third year in the UK, where I did most of my cores. Uh, so I did medicine there with Professor Ash, and it was amazing. And uh, also I did uh, OBGYN there, which was great as well. And um, surgery was amazing. It's, uh, it's all, I c you can already tell that I enjoyed a lot of different rotations. And I also want to point out that that can cause some stress in, in the fact that you think that you might be confused. You like everything. You don't know what to choose. But I want to assure you that that's completely normal, at least for me. And I think that's a good thing, that if you just are excited about various specialties, and just you'll, it, you'll still be able to make a choice in the end. Um, so, uh, I did the, uh, my, so I did also so I did medicine, uh, OBGYN, oh, and pediatrics with Dr. Mickey in the UK as well, which was great. And um, I went back to New York to complete my, the rest of my course. And I did some of them at, at Brooklyn Hospital, where I did like, some electives and hematology, and uh, did some neurology elective too at, um, at the St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital. And, so I, and I completed the rest of my rotations in New York and then um, matched into internal medicine at, at USC. But so the clinical experience was, was varied and uh, in different locations. But I think that you can learn a lot about all the sites that UC has to offer. And I understand that you have even more sites. So uh, whereas I know some people would rather stay in one, one core site, but I would be an advocate into if you can and if you're interested, please do not hesitate to move around a lot and you can learn and have different connections and make friends all over the place as well. I think that was, it was a, a good decision for that too. Sure. Um, I, my experience uh, during the clinical years was a bit different from Dr. Canal. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I stayed mainly in New York City. Um, I rotated over uh, throughout the various hospitals in New York. Uh, I, I remember doing... Uh, most of my calls at Brooklyn Hospital in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, I did a uh, surgery rotation at Staten Island University in, uh, in Staten Island. Um, I did some uh, electives at Nassau University uh, Medical Center. Uh, and I did uh, family medicine at Bronx, Lebanon. Uh, so I say all these sides to tell you that uh, along, along with the variety they provided, they gave me a sense of adaptability as I went on. Especially now as a fellow and uh, having rotated in uh, three different hospitals, you, I find myself very used to the various hospital systems. Every hospital has a different culture within itself, within which they practice. So uh, clinical years were very anxious times for me as a medical student, partly because, I mean, you didn't, it wasn't in one particular hospital where you can just, all right, get used to the hospital and just go about your business of just uh, seeing patients and all that. I think, looking back, though, I think the variety in various hospitals kind of made me very adaptable in life and actually has proven to be a strength and an asset throughout my uh, career going forward. Um, so that's what I would say about my clinical rotations. Um, I'll just add on to that maybe. So, and if you, 
know that about yourself, that you would rather be in one location, then it's good that there's uh, options for that at AUC. I know you can do all your cores in one place too, but you can also mix it up. And do, so for example, me being in the UK, so I did a lot of my rotations at Ealing uh, in third year, but and that provided what you were saying uh, about the uh, stability of just having one hospital and one culture to adapt to and know people through the various uh, rotations, because you know sometimes it's just a rotation for six weeks at a time or 12 weeks at a time with, can go by really fast. So um, having been at Ealing for a lot of different kinds of rotation was nice to have that stability. But I agree with you that varying the locations and the different cultures and the different mentors that you may have and friends that you can make and all the different patient populations and learning the pathologies that are specific to each location, I think that was very invaluable as well for uh, learning at through the clinical rotations that AUC offers, but also, as Iman says, for your career in the future. And uh, as you can tell, I've moved around a lot, but I think that is uh, that was always a great learning opportunity and very fun as well. Yeah, and I mean, looking back though, I wish I'd done the UK, the UK experience because I do think <laughs> that it would have given me an, uh, an opportunity to have lived in Europe and really studied in Europe and really explored Europe. So um, that's some, one regret I have about my clinical science rotations. I wish I'd taken the AUC up on the opportunity to study in Europe. Right, and I'll say also as a Canadian, um, I was particularly interested, and I think that was the main reason that I originally wanted to go there, to ha experience a different medical system and see what it was like, and I think that was invaluable as well. And I don't even, I get that question a lot to, uh, about uh, if, you, if you want to match into a specific specialty, normally you have to, the thought is that you have to do it in America, but I actually didn't do any of my medicine rotations, uh, the cores, and well, actually I did one core in, in America, but uh, I didn't do my medicine rotations in America and I matched into medicine, so. Sure. All right, we'll go on to the next question, which was, uh, have you experienced uh, different treatment as an IMG uh, candidate? This was, personally to, for me, this was something that I was very concerned about as a student. Uh, having to go to the Caribbean, coming to come to St. Martin for my medical school training. And truthfully speaking, it's, it's a matter of the mentality that you as the individual have towards that. Uh, during, during my clinical clerkship and all that, um, you, would, you would rotate with other IMG candidates and also other U.S. Uh, US uh, med, school, med school students. And it's, it's also, I think, if you do have the understanding that you did get a quality education in uh, AUC and you're very adequately prepared to be wherever stage in medicine that you are, it should give you confidence, not necessarily any sense of inferiority or anything going forward. So I'm, I'm better now than I was as a student, and I'm basically here to basically tell you that not necessarily. It's, I think we are very critical, as self-critical in ourselves when we're going through as students. So uh, the, the world, uh, most, most of my clerkships and most of my attendants would not, didn't really treat me any differently. They treated you as a medical student who was uh, a student of medicine, and they really expected more from me because I, at that point they really wanted me to be good. So I think it's something that is very much in your head as a student of an IMG uh, school. So I, I don't think you should dwell more too much about it, uh, but know that you're getting a great quality education here in the island and you will, you will be very adequately prepared to, for medicine wherever you do, whatever specialty you do decide to go into. I don't know if... Uh, yeah, no, I yeah. agree with that. Um, and, but to answer the question, like short answer is I did not experience any, any problems just being IMG and I would add, uh, so in my clinical rotations, no. And definitely in the UK, I mean, I don't think that they would know that they necessarily knew the difference between IMG or just American students. They would call American, and I was like, I'm actually Canadian and Haitian, but no, no, no. So it, it, everybody was well, very welcoming, um, and definitely that was not a problem at all in the UK. In America, in New York, I think there's so many students, and they have, and that was helpful uh, that there were AUC students that had gone through these sites before, and they would say that they would have had good experiences with us. So I didn't, 
I didn't have any problems with that at all. But I would also add that in interview, on the interview trail for residency, that it always turned out to be a positive thing. I've never had it turn into a question of why did you, they, they ask it, they ask, but if you answer in a way that's truthful and it ends up being more interesting and showing that you're perseverant and also they always find something to talk about more uh, when I bring that up. And, you know, I've never had a problem with that at all. And actually it turns out to be a positive and a differentiating factor and they remember uh, you when they know that about you. And, but at the end of the day, what matters is if you are good as in if you take your time and if you're interested and if you don't know the answer that you read up on it and you just show enthusiasm and just um, yeah. that matters the most. So and I think when that is the, the, the background or the baseline, then when they hear about the Caribbean or the IMG part, then you are that much more memorable because if they, if they don't have a lot of experience with Caribbean students, for example, then you have made a good impression and you know, that's how it worked out for me, I would say. Sounds good. Um, so in a nutshell, I think it's worse in your head as a student of an IMG. Yeah, so just I, I agree with that too. And as a Canadian IMG, that needs a visa to work in America. And also, you know, that, yeah. yeah. Just, just wear that badge with honor and you'll be fine. So yeah, be don't prideful, worry as much. Boastful. Know that you're good. I mean, you work hard. Know to that get you're here. prepared. It's true. I think, of, you know, preparation... Let's say the preparation meaning and uh, opportunity is, I don't, I don't know who I'm paraphrasing, but that's true that um, if you're prepared, whenever opportunity comes around, then you'll be able to, you know, use that. And that's, that's exactly. what luck is, I guess. But, you know, we're really prepared here and you should be confident in that and, you know, move forward in that manner. Yeah. Sounds good. We will go on to the next question. Um, what inspired you to choose your specialty? Well... I would say that, as I kind of mentioned before, I was interested in v many different parts of medicine. Uh, and when I did my core rotations in internal medicine, I was impressed by how, how broad the knowledge base should be. And that was kind of daunting, but also challenging and interesting. And, you know, I would aspire to do that. And when you meet a good mentor, um, and I'm not just saying that because Professor Ash is here, but uh, it definitely made a big difference. Um, and uh, learning about the different parts of medicine and different patient populations. And, you know, um, that's what I liked about internal medicine. Because like I said, and as a student, whenever we would hear about different parts of uh, medicine and basic science classes, I was like, well, maybe it's like a bad thing because I know I like a lot of things. I'm confused. I don't know what I will apply it to, into, but that aspect of medicine that is so broad was useful to me in, in picking that specialty. And also in rheumatology, you still have to know, a a, a, you have to have a broad knowledge of medicine still. So those are the kinds of things that um, started my interest in that, but also having good mentors and uh, also made my decision easier, but um, I would I would agree with you. My uh, I I evolved into gastroenterology. I t I would say I took the scenic route. Uh, I was I was one of those med students who didn't quite know for sure what they wanted to do. Yeah. I wasn't oh born to be a, a, a this type of doctor from the very beginning. Um, I knew I enjoyed medicine. I loved learning pathophysiology. I liked the mental stimulation of it. And I also liked to do, I liked procedures. So along the way, I would test out a lot of the various specialties and basically rule them in and rule them out. Uh, surgery I did, surgery, surgery is not for everybody. I enjoyed surgery, but it was a bit too, too com cumbersome and complicated for me. So I said no. But ultimately what, what brought me to medicine was the mental stimulation it gave. I, I remember a uh, pathophys class, really enjoying physiology and actually being, having it be a very mind-stimulating uh, thing for me. So I said medicine, med medicine would be a good specialty for me. And within medicine, I really wanted to specialize in something that came very naturally to me. I wasn't really exerting a lot of brain power to like, get good at. And gastroenterology was something to me that I, I kind of got. I understood exactly what was going on. I knew exactly what the problem is. So it was something that naturally I found was a good fit. 
and it gave me the combination of mental stimulation with a disease like cirrhosis uh, to really understand pathophys of actually the liver and everything that could go wrong. And actually, procedure-based like colonoscopy, ERCP, EUS. So it gave me the hybrid of procedure and mental stimulation that I was looking for. I came, up, I came into GI mainly because of a mentor. Uh, to this day, he's a very good friend of mine. Um, he really encouraged me in my second year of residency to really come spend time in the endoscopy unit, really get to really get a sense of what the gastroenterologist does on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think with that, my interest deepened, and I really enjoyed, I would go to endoscopy and really spend countless hours there and really not feel like it's a big deal, because I really enjoyed learning about what they were doing. So. To answer the question, I think I came to my field mainly as a result of interest and also as a result of ruling other specialties out yeah. uh, and being open to men good mentorship and all that. So by no means was I, did I knew that I was going to be a gastroenterologist when I was in AUC. I decided on GI when I, my, my second year of internal medicine residency. And I think as a result of that, I really took time to really figure out what my interest are, is, and I'm fairly happy with my choice at the moment. So, yeah. So it's kind of similar, yeah. So mentorship and you know staying open and trying to see all the kinds of things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think you'll have a better idea when you do the rotation, and that's why uh, even through residency, uh, finding good mentors and uh, exploring what your interests are. I think yeah, that's very important. So for me too. So I'm a rheumatologist, and I've it's kind of similar to you, although we have yeah a lot of mental stimulation and uh, thinking and talking to the patient. And uh, my for me too, there was a longitudinal care was important to me because I enjoy the time with the patient and the chronic illnesses and you know and it's a predominantly uh, a female patient population as well which I kind of enjoyed so I yeah I don't know if I mentioned I thought I wanted to be an OBGYN when I uh, before med school but I also enjoyed that so we have a lot of GYN patients in common with uh, rheumatology actually so um, the breadth of knowledge there and also we do procedures so um, uh, joint injections and so what I'm saying is, if you don't know what you want to do yet, that's okay, and I think that's the most common uh, scenario. But if you do know, that's even better, and life is probably a little bit easier. But I would still say, even if you think you do know what you want to do, staying open is only going to make you more well-rounded and a better applicant and a better doctor and a better person in general. So I would just say, take advantage of all the opportunities that are out there, but make sure that you're actually interested in that just doing things just to show that you're doing a bunch of different things. But if you're truly interested, if you're doing a lot of different things that has a commonality with your personality or with what you want to do, then that would make sense. But to your point um, earlier too, when we had a discussion that uh, just doing a lot of different the things just to try to fill up your CV with different things that don't really make sense that you're not interested in, I don't think that would give as much uh, yield. So. Sure, sure. Um, so the next question is, describe what a typical day in the life of a rheumatologist is. So I, I work in clinic mostly, um, but I do see uh, patients in the hospital. So as a rheumatologist, um, it's a lot of outpatient care for chronic illnesses. So I typically have, um, and I also work in an academic center right now, so it makes a little bit of difference. And you'll see I'll use go forward. There's different options. So in internal medicine specialties, you can, and most specialties in medicine, you can choose to work uh, in a hospital-based setting, or academic-based hospital um, setting, or just a private practice that's just clinics, um, or a combination of both. So um, personally, right now, um, I was very interested in teaching, and I wanted to work in an academic center and also a large multi-specialty uh, center as well. Um, so my day-to-day -day is uh, I work right now for uh, full days of clinic a week, um, and uh, uh, we have, uh, I'm on call uh, at two weeks at a time in the hospital as well. So after clinic, I see patients in the hospital when we have consultations. And, um, and yeah, I do both of those things. So in clinic, I just see a variety of patients from lupus patients to scleroderma patients and um, 
and continue managing their medications. And also we cover the infusion centers because a lot of our medications get biologic medications. And I have a lot of patients in common with the gastroenterologists um, for inflammatory bowel disease patients that also get arthritis. Um, they, uh, we treat those ones in, in, in the infusion clinics. So my day-to-day -day actually is I'm in clinic mostly, but I also cover the infusion suite and I have to work there as well. And then we work in the hospital um, and uh, we have students and, and residents and fellows that we teach as well. And so every so often there are lectures and hands-on um, hands procedures that we teach and yeah. Sure. Um, my day, I, I, I mean, I pretty much probably speaking more of like uh, as a fellow at the moment. But uh, as a current uh, third-year fellow, uh, uh, third-year GI fellow, my day usually starts, uh, these days I'm scoping a lot. So I'm in the endoscopy unit quite often. And my day usually starts around 8 a.m. Uh, I would go in and usually either the night before, or a few hour, an hour or two before going in, I would have read up on my patients that I'm going to scope for the day. Uh, Ms. Jones is coming in for a colonoscopy for whatever reason. Uh, that way, there's, a, there's some form of thought before going to do the procedure, what to expect and what I'm going to need. And so usually around 8 o'clock, we'll go to the endoscopy unit. Uh, usually the first few patients will be there getting triage, getting ready for the procedure. Say hello, do a quick HMP, and uh, go into the first case. And depending on what the case is, it could be an uh, upper endoscopy, it could be a colonoscopy. It could be uh, endoscopic ultrasound or an ERCP for gallstone, gallstone disease, uh, biliary disease. So depending on what the case is, it could take anywhere from a good 15 minutes to 30 minutes of procedure to anywhere to a couple hours of, of the procedure. So depending on the com complexity of the, of the patient. And usually, I think for the most part, for academic GI, you are probably scoping th two and a half to three days a week. And the other days you're in the office seeing patients, trying to do follow-ups, schedule patients for procedures and all of that. And then your day literally ends to the last day, to the last procedure. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a, a set in stone end time. So uh, sometimes depending on the day, you can finish around 5 p.m. Sometimes you go as late as 7. Uh, but it goes back to uh, my point I said in the beginning. If you enjoy doing what you, if you enjoy what you're doing, it really doesn't matter how long you're doing it. But there's a sense of work-life balance to it. But uh, some days uh, you do have an emergency with like grandma who swallowed uh, a piece of steak that wouldn't go down that you'd have to urgently go and try to relieve the obstruction, or you'd have an upper GI bleed that it's an emergency. It's an emergency that you can't really uh, put, put off to the next day. So emergencies do, ha do happen, but you try to stay and take care of all of this. So, and a part of me likes the unpredictability of my work because uh, the adrenaline kicks in and then the excitement also kicks in. But it's a, it's a fair balance that I, I like. I don't know if some... some the thing with medicine, I've realized, is that you can tailor to your own right. personality. And that's the beauty of medicine that I've found. So you choose your specialty also along the lines of your personality type and all that. Yeah, and I agree with that. But also I would say that it can also change over time for a particular person. So obviously internal medicine residency was very busy and fellowship and rheumatology was less busy than residency sometimes but also um, now as a rheumatologist so I work not I don't work weekends as much as before and my schedule is pretty uh, steady it's like usually well the clinics are set from eight to five uh, you, but usually you can you stay longer too if there's a, other things going on or procedures that I have to do or if there's emergencies but also since I'm I cover the hospital consultation so it depends on how many consults we get and how busy the ER is or you know how sick the patients are and if they're ICU lupus patients or vasculitis patients and I have to order plasma phoresis on them or those kinds of things it might take a long time and sometimes I set work till 9 p.m. or um, but also what 
Iman says is very important. If you enjoy what you're doing, you know, it makes it all worth it. But you don't have to know that uh, all those details of what your day-to-day -day life would be right now. But when you'll be in the rotations and you'll be exposed to what a day-to-day -day, uh, life of your attending is, and you know, you can ask them questions. And that's why I also stress it's good to have a good mentor and also have varied experiences and to see how, because not all gastroenterologists, I'm sure, have the same experience and even in rheumatology I mean most out rheumatology practices are outpatient rheumatology and uh, um, schedules that are more steady but you know I, I have a lot of other friends that just cover the hospital more and you know so it, you can you can vary that as well and also as internists it's really nice that we're double boarded so um, if I want to keep up with my medicine or I just want to just uh, make extra money or moonlight or you know I could always go back to the hospital and do a hospital medicine or there's some other job opportunities that you know I was considering even last year um, just working primary care even after a rheumatology fellowship if uh, if that sounds good you can you can have a mix of both and and tailor your lifestyle to what you want and you know even as gastroenterology you could just yeah. decide to do that too so um, yeah it's and yeah no matter what the personality uh, in medicine you can find something that would fit exactly so the takeaway with that is that uh, by no means are we saying this day-to-day uh, 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 -day activity is the rule. There are a lot of variations, and you'll find that gastroenterologists in Idaho practicing very differently than a gastroenterologist in New York. Some gastroenterologists are doing outpatient only. Some are doing inpatient only. Some are doing a hybrid model. So that's the beauty of medicine today. You can kind of like tailor it to your own fit. Yeah. And some people only like private practices, and some people only like hospitals, um, hospital-based clinics. So even within outpatient, there's different kinds of outpatient. And now there's going to be multi-specialty and multidisciplinary clinics. So that's more towards academics. But I personally like uh, working with my colleagues in other specialties. And we have lupus clinic with our nephrology attendings that we do that, and then we look at the urine together and do like those kinds of things. And uh, whereas some of my other friends in rheumatology, they just want to do their little their rheumatology. Uh, clinic and just refer out to uh, specialists when the cases are too complicated for just the outpatient um, private practice um, setting. So, you know, even within a specific kind of practice, there's different variety as well, and you can change over time too. Exactly. So. All right, so we'll go on to the next question. Do you have any advice or tips on how to succeed as a medical student and also as a resident? So I think this is where it's very applicable to where we are right now as medical students. Um, and I think uh, as, as medical students, I think now I, I encounter a lot of medical students and rotations more than on, in the basic science. Yeah. In the basic science, I'm a big believer in take care of what is in front of you right now. That way you don't look back and have regrets. Um, so in, cl in, in clinical sciences, you have your biochemistry, your physiology exam coming up next week, all that. That is your main focus. Take care of that, hunker down, uh, study. And also uh, med school, you can do it by yourself. You need a team, you need your support group of friends to, to do it with, mainly to keep you sane, but also to, to encourage you as you go along. Let's go to the library. You don't feel like going, but hey, we're all going together, so you go to the library and study. So do that. At the basic science level, come up with a support group of friends that you have who are like-minded like you are. Take care of business. Study for your courses. Pass them. Ace them. By so doing, you are studying for your steps. And by so doing, it kind of like is a domino effect. If you're taking care of what you, it's in front of you today, Ultimately, you're taking care of what will come tomorrow. So at a basic science level, take care of what is in front of you now. And also have a good balance. Because ultimately, you have to be able to find useful ways of dealing with stress and be very adaptable with when you're going through this. Yeah, yeah what do you, what, I think that's, basic, basic that's very today? important. I agree with everything you said. Um, and also... You know, and to tie in with the question that we asked about earlier, I was being treated differently as an IMG, or although we said no, but I mean, we also get the confidence by knowing that 
we are prepared as AC students and we you know what the pass rate of the USMLE is, but also, you know, having passed your USMLE with high grades as well is very important to just, when you do get the self-doubts, you know, you can at least rely on that. And also, um, that's the most important thing that uh, residency program programs do look at. So now we're on the other side and we interview fellows and, um, well, I don't resident. interview fellows. I'm, I am a fellow, but yeah. I do interview. Uh, I was chief resident, so I do interview for residents. Yeah, but you do that. interview the new fellows coming yeah, on too. Exactly. You know, if you don't want them to be there. talking but, about our interviews, we are going through our fellowship interviews for next year. So as chief fellow, I'm part of. Yeah, see. Selection. So you know, we uh, in the interview um, process, you know, it is really a tool to differentiate, and there is really a cutoff for um, USMLE. Uh, step scores and in a way I think that's also positive so just um, the fact that we can ace the USMLE so well just being by AUC um, then there's no question that we're good enough or whatever it is for the um, the next steps in residency and you know so I would say that I agree with Iman that right now in basic sciences at AUC you should just focus on your classes and learning the best you can because there's some things that you know and basic sciences, you won't see all the things that you study uh, right now in your rotations, but in residency, you might remember, oh, I remember like studying this with um, yeah, Professor so-and-so at AC in the island, but I'd never seen a case until now, you know? So it's very important still, and you might think it's a lot of like words or genetic conditions that you will never see, but you do see them, okay? So, um, but also, like Iman said, it's going to help you study for step one. Just if you do a good job day to day, then it'll have less to do in the end, and you'll already know your material in and out. So I would say do that, but to your point too, enjoying the island and managing your stress and also self-care, I think it's very important. And it's not like they teach, well, they didn't teach me that in school before, but you know, self-care and as a, as a physician, you'll see how important that is to deal with stress and avoid burnout. And that's a very real thing and the skill that I think is the most important because I, we know a lot of uh, physicians actually that you know they're the great physicians but if you can't uh, manage the stress or if you don't have time for self-care you don't make it a priority then you know it it, it ends up not not being yeah. fruitful um, yeah. if you can't don't take care of yourself first so um, learning these tools at all the steps uh, through med school through residency through fellowship and all of that I think is very important so uh, I agree with you for that. and AC is a good place for that because you can really quickly just have a little 30 minute break and you're at the beach already and you can clear your mind and then go back to studying the for the 10th time the same thing you know so enjoy that too awesome so for the clinical rotation student um that these are students that i kind of still brooklyn is one of our sites that we have a ec students rotate oh. and so i i still happen to have the opportunity to interact with clinical rotation students and my number one advice is that come each day very enthusiastic to learn. Because uh, as, as a fellow, it, it's very helpful when you have an enthusiastic student who wants to learn for me to equally give back to, with that level of enthusiasm. Because if, even if you don't want to be a gastroenterologist, you don't want to be an internist, just the curiosity to learn, to want to know, goes a long way in kind of like being a receiver of the knowledge that your attendant has, your, your resident has, or your fellow has. So that mindset of enthusiasm alone goes a long way. Yeah, um, I agree with that too. And you know, truthfully, we also learn from the med students too. And you being enthusiastic, you can teach us a lot of things as well. But um, if you are enthusiastic and really want to learn, even if you don't know everything, if you ask questions that are based on the fact of, are out of interest and not just asking questions for the sake of asking questions. Uh, we really appreciate that as well, and we can see how your uh, mind works and what your, uh, your strengths are and what your weaknesses are, and just those kinds of things are the things that we use to write a letter of recommendation and um, build rapport and all of that. So, you know, being enthusiastic and being, uh, having energy and being uh, genuine with your questions, is, I would say that, but also after seeing the patients, which you learn the most from, you should definitely read up on the cases and for me personally, I'm not sure if you agree, but um, I prob you probably do. 
is that I learn the most from the patients and then reading about those cases and maybe and now it's easy to search for questions that are related and maybe do some you know in residency there's mix up questions for internal medicine but um, you know you can do the USMLE world questions and uh, based on the different topics so I would say um, that learning when you have a patient and you can understand all the different kinds of ways and the questions help you think about the case in different in different ways and also go from the pathophysiology um, to the lab findings to what the uh, to the history and you can build all the pieces together and go to the pharmacology and then you can see what the drug mechanism was and you can review all the kinds of courses that you go through in basic sciences but keep that up in uh, the for the rotations as well because you'll need that knowledge for step three more so than step two I would say right um, so in step three you, you yeah you'll just combine everything so just by doing that day to day like to build upon what we said before if you just do that kind of work every day then you'll be ready for step three before you know it um, and you won't have to study for it because it's true that during your res residency uh, uh, residency work really you're really busy as an intern so have already been prepared for step three not having to take so much time to study would be useful so just building habits now that are useful I, f I feel like I wish I had done that more um, but um, yeah just when you see cases just read up on, on that topic more and all the aspects that you can learn from it basically from one case and then you'll remember more I would say so exactly I mean just to add to that take interest in your patients ultimately take genuine interest in not um, because ultimately your exam your exam questions are going to be cases that you've seen throughout your rotations at some point it was whether it was a matter it's, it's a matter of whether you took the time to really take interest then to really slow it down and really study that patient so take genuine interest in your patients they are their greatest teacher when on the rotations uh, go home like uh, the canal is saying go home if we saw an, a patient with asthma in the inpatient go home and read on asthma for 30 minutes Come, come the next day and have questions. Oh, Dr. Forey, I was reading an asthma. I didn't quite understand this. Could you help elaborate? If you ask me that as a student, I'm very excited because I'm like, you went home, took the patient care to heart, read up on it, and now you're coming back with some questions. I would give you a good 30, an hour of my time because you took that initiative to really want to know. That is what I'm talking about, about just take, genuine interest in your patient and have yeah. the curiosity to come and want to learn. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. But I would also add that, I mean, take interest in the whole, and that's part of taking interest in the patient too. And sometimes they're here just because they're sick and they care more about something else. And they don't only need you to just be a doctor and fix what's wrong, but they also might need you to just listen to them or just, you know, maybe try to talk to their family for them or just make a difference in a way that you don't even need basic science uh, studies for. You just need to be uh, another human being next to them and just help them through. And sometimes it's true that in medicine, especially in rheumatology, there's a lot of cases that we don't um, have an answer for or there's a lot of chronic illnesses that you know are terminal or and you'll have to have difficult situations uh, that we're not really prepared for in basic sciences per se on paper but you know just being there and if you're generally genuinely interested in just helping and just you can maybe just sitting there and listening to them is what your best job could be that day and not just reading about, about obscure diseases or genetic conditions and knowing the best answer but um, just being there and listening could be all that you do and that's even more important and more appreciated than, than that so always remember that you're it's you're learning and not just using the patient's case for interest but also you know just for your own personal growth for your growth and for their um, personal needs as well so always ask questions always ask questions uh, if it comes to your mind ask it and find a tactful way of asking questions on rounds when I was a student I used to be very mindful of the decision making my attendants were making because otherwise you could sit at home and read a book but the book will give you CAT scan, x-ray, ultrasound, all on the same page and not really give you guidance on which one to do first. So on the clinical rounds, pay attention to your decision making that your attendants, your residents are making. Uh, oh, why, why are we doing an ultrasound instead of a CAT scan? 
because trust me, that's where your step, your CK question is going to be like. Patient yeah. comes in with this best, ultrasound, this, this, the this. best next step. <laughs> exactly. So pay attention to these clinical decision making things on rounds, and almost act like a baby. Why? 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 That's where you're going to get a lot of bang for your money, your buck on on clinical rotations. So uh, be be very present during your rotation. Show interest and ask questions. You get a lot from it. Yeah. Yes. And make time for yourself, like I said. I think that's very important, too. So I think at this point, we are just going to pause here and see if uh, the audience has any questions or give it back to Gus. Uh, yeah, so if anybody has any questions, uh, we can go over, and I'll bring the microphone. Dr. Lucero, you have a question. Perhaps you're going to talk about this in a minute, but I'm curious, what inspired you to initiate Community Action Day? Oh, yeah, that's why we're here, actually. Yeah. So, that's, that's a very great question. Um, so from, I mean, I, I think this goes back to my upbringing in Ghana and also my, my training, my college years at Xavier University. Uh, Xavier, for those of you who don't know, uh, is a very Jesuit uh, university in Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, going into Xavier, this whole idea of men and women for others, uh, all for one, one for all, a sense of accountability to the community. Uh, I walked away as a result of four years down in Xavier with a sense of uh, like ownership to the community, a sense of needing to contribute to the com community, wherever that community may be. And uh, on Xavier's campus, there is uh, a similar event where one, one day out of the semester, the whole idea of having multiple volunteer sites for the student body to volunteer in, is, Xavier has a very similar event there on its campus. So when we got to AUC, Beatrice and I uh, had somehow, I think, uh, along our conversations and us, we got a sense that we are, as an average student on AUC's campus then, there was a disconnect in terms of a sense of contribution to the community. There was a sense that we just came here for clinical rotation, for uh, basic science, and then 15 months later or something, you just ship off right back to the States without any sense of contributing or belonging to the community. So I think from our discussion, yeah. then we said, oh, maybe we should do something. Right. And also, you know, a lot of us, and not just us, just, and that's why it's important, too, to make time for your friends and just take time off of just the study part um, of, of the training. So in one of our conversations, we we're saying a lot of people want to contribute and want to do, but it's really hard to find. It was really hard to find what to do and also find the time to even think about going to do something and then find the time to arrange it and be useful and not just do something for the sake of putting it on your CV and just have an extra thing, bullet point in your community service section. But also, you know, so we were talking about that, that we kind of felt not that we wish we could do something like that, to, or that we wish we could continue our community service kind of things that we used to do in the past. And me growing up in Haiti and always throughout um, my uh, training, having a lot of teachers and family members that also emphasize the contributing to the community. And a lot of us in medicine all ultimately want to help. And what better way to just help a community at large in addition to helping the individual patients, you know? So. Um, uh, yeah, as part of a conversation like this, and then Iman brought it up. So it was basically Iman's idea, really. Oh. But um, we wanted, and he asked me what I thought about it, and I thought that was an amazing idea for all those reasons, because number one, we don't have time to try to find the specific plot, and then also, uh, not uh, we kind of want to hang out with our friends as well, because all of us uh, have the same stresses and want to just have fun together while being useful. But we, I thought that was a very good idea to have one day that we set aside and we plan it out with the block exam schedule that we had. I understand this changing now that you have different kind of exams, but anyway, at the time, all the semesters had exams on one day, so we would say that we could plan it out when we know that 
people don't have as much work to do and also give a variety of options so that whatever your interests are or however uh, if you like being outside you could do the beach cleanup or something or if you like being with kids you can um, reach out and help the um, the kids community or if you want to work with different abilities and there's different kinds of foundations that help and also we learned and we wanted to learn about the community in St. Martin while we were here so I thought that was a great idea so we started the process um, after we talked to Dr. Ashley, um, the late Dr. Ashley, which was really, really, really helpful in this as well. And Dr. Testa, Ron Testa was really, uh, a really helpful member as well. And yeah, that's, that, but that's why we started, to try to help out, but also to make it easy for not only us, but yes, exactly. to make it easy for us as well, and make it easy for the rest of the students to uh, have a, uh, an impact to the, on the community and also to exchange with them. So exactly. thank you for your question though, yeah. Exactly, exactly. That was, I mean, it, by no means did we think it was going to get this big, by the way. It was, it was First just. First of all, I it, didn't realize it was 10 years ago. I know, so it's, but, and I didn't realize that it was, it was, it, it had continued. Um, so when we left actually, so we did um, two instances. So the first one was during our third semester, I believe. Yes, yeah. and then we did another one, the, Fifth semester, right? the second one, yeah, yeah I, I can't remember, but then before we left, we passed the baton over, we had a little, you know, we held a little interviews to recruit the next Community Action Day leaders, and I think um, Alex Fox, Steve Antoine, and then they did a good job in continuing, and I guess you guys are still doing it, and now we're here, so that's amazing, and we're really happy to be here for that, so thank you for having us. And uh, I mean, I think I, for one, I want to say, I mean, for for the students among us, this is this is an example of how much you can contribute. This is a, don't ever think that you can make an impact as an individual student or as an individual person. Uh, you just have to get together with like-minded individuals to really start something. And uh, we are very happy the school has taken it on, and now become it's become a a, a very part of the fabric of AUC and uh, AUC student body on campus. So um, by no means did we think it was going to get this big, but we, it came out of a sense of wanting to contribute. And I think as medical students, we all went into medicine with a sense of contributing something to our fellow human being and our, and our community. Right. So, and also, I mean, AUC has kind of that culture as well. I mean, they have the honor and service society, so it was always part of that, but it, we felt that I mean, that it was maybe sometimes disjointed or you had to be, I think FICAI did a lot of service um, options too, but I wasn't personally part of FICAI, yeah. but we were, uh, when I was on the SGA meeting, so I was the secretary, so I was listening on all the conversation and meet with all the different clubs at the time, which I understand now there's so many more, which is amazing as well. But um, we also wanted to have options for people that were in different, student groups and not just have uh, uh, service events for the specific association. So actually, I think it was the first time that all the student organizations actually contributed money when we were first fundraising we just asked fifty dollars to um, all the organization we had to explain all these ideas and people were like we don't have we won't have a lot of time but it took some time we had to delay it when like a month or so at some point but you know everybody contributed at first so then everybody felt involved which I mean and they were really involved and at first we didn't have we, we were with our friends that have cars not a lot of people had cars and seeing who, who's going to what side at the same time and you know so it was a lot of logistics but because people felt involved and we wanted to include all the different groups and they actually contributed out of their own funds because there was no uh, there was no money just for that, so we had to just piece it together, and the student body helped us raise some money as well, and we started like that, so. All right, thank you. Yeah, okay, so we have another question here, so I'm gonna move the microphone. Um, did you ever talk about any experiences that you had on the island um, during your clinic, or during your residency interviews? Well, uh, um, do you have an answer? I, I, for one, I not specifically any. I mean, I think when we were here, we had a hurricane camp. Though. Yeah, well, yeah, we had Omar, but we it had, was not as bad as. So 
I, 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 well, I saw my experience on the island as a, an experience of resilience and adaptability. Yeah. That's how I pitched it on my interview trail. Uh, I mean, the idea that having to leave your home country of maybe the U.S. or wherever to come to a new island solely on the hopes of a dream of you becoming a doctor. To me, if you're telling me that story on, on the interview trail, I mean, it's, 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 it's commendable. Right. So you, to me, that's how I, I saw it. And as some of you current students, you went, just went through a hurricane uh, here. Oh, yeah. That kind of derailed your whole uh, studying. So if, if I'm going on the interview trail, yeah. I would definitely mention how much of, how much of that experience has imp like basically contributed to your dedication to see your dream come true. So uh, for sure, like I said, it's, there's a lot of assets in your experience on this island and training here. You just need to talk to your mentors and see how to articulate it on the interview trail to really come off uh, very well. Yes, and I mean, I was, that was a great answer, and I agree with that a lot. And uh, yeah, the, and the fact that you are adaptable is very useful in medicine in general. Um, but uh, I mean, even if we just look at the experience that AUC has available, um, with just in my interviews personally, uh, it was brought up that we had the cadaver lab, which a lot of uh, med schools don't even have cadavers um, for anatomy class, for example, so that, that was one thing. But I agree with Iman, just going out of your way and leaving where you live uh, to just follow your your career path is has always been a positive in the interview trail. And, you know, they ask questions about that a lot in a positive way. So now that you you recently went through all of that, it can only help. And the fact that you're here is very commendable for real, so. Great, and do we have any other questions for Dr. Oforia and Dr. Kinnall? Any other questions? All right, we have one more question here. So you talked a little bit about, uh, you know, some of your experiences having been different from that of U.S. medical students. Um, as far as uh, in terms of helping to make your residency applications more competitive, what were some of the similarities to U.S. medical students that you would talk about? Like, for example, membership in professional associations or networking, research, going to conferences, things like that. So, I mean, I would... I mean, I look back, now I look, obviously look back to my, my med school application and I, I, I think it's very anemic, but that's because I've had the benefit of years looking back. Uh, but I mean, now, outside of, outside of scores, I've been on uh, a chief resident and I've been on, uh, on the other side of interviewing applicants for positions in uh, residency. Outside of scores, uh, we're looking for well-roundedness. And uh, basically, I think, I, I very, I remember vividly uh, talking a lot about my experience growing up in Ghana, my having to immigrate to the to US um, and also coming down to the island. So that all throughout my application was a sense of adaptability and uh, having to go through a lot of adversity. Not to say that, it, not to put a negative spin to it, but to say that in spite of all that, I'm here. And the residency is challenging in itself, and I'm the type of candidate who is not just going to bow. I'm just going to push through and succeed, and I'm a very reliable candidate. So I think uh, in our earlier small session, I wanted to mention that on the other end, I enjoy candidates who give me a little bit of pushback on the interview, in the interview session hey, why did you do this research? I may think it's a negative, but if you're able to convince me in that little short space of time that, no, it's actually a positive, I respect that. I just don't want an applicant who is just going to take my, what my interpretation of their, their CV or the application as a negative for it. You should be able to go back and forth with your interviewer, not in a very challenging way, but to say, hey, I mean, I see where you're coming from, but this is also how this made me a more competitive applicant. So by no means, are you, you are interviewing for a residency spot, but you're also, they are, they are giving you a spot, but you're also choosing. So just don't go on the interview trail and say, I'll take whatever you, just give a little pushback and 
I would respect that as an, as an interviewer. So I respect that you're going to come in and really have a, have a backbone to really go after what you think, uh, what you think is right. Right, and I think the question also mentioned about compare, uh, the compar comp comparison between IMGs and U.S. grads. Yeah. So, I mean, being on the other side now, I see actually when we do have an IMG applicant, usually their scores are, it's, it seems like, and I, I'm biased, I guess, but it's, it seems like because we went out of our way or had a different path, that was not the traditional path. Um, to residency application, it's usually there is uh, the sense of perseverance and the sense that you want you really want it, and also that you do extra well on your step scores even. So there's some metrics I'm sure that can show that. And um, in addition to, so now there's so many different student groups that you can be a part of at AUC, so they do the same. Uh, and so you should be able to have the, the same kinds of things that a US medical grads have uh, on their CV. And uh, as part of your statement letter, you can just expand on that. And I know that AC has a lot of support uh, for, uh, even for us when we were there, that we could send in. And, or CVs and they can comment and edit, but apparently now there's so many more things available to you, so that I'm really happy to see that, and it's very, going to be very useful, and even mock interviews and all of that that uh, was mentioned before, so um, I think they do have that as a part of a lot of U.S. med schools, so now we're on board as well, so I think that is going to be even more helpful. But. Yeah, I think, I think to, to add to it, uh, Dr. Kino has a point. I find that talking about similarities and differences, uh, IMGs, you do unfortunately have to work harder and pass your exams and do really well. You have to do score higher compared to your U.S. schools for some of these specialties. That is a known fact. There, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, but as far as uh, similarities, research is something now that is being pushed a lot. Um, so, and the idea is that more and more internal medicine programs and family medicine programs or whatever programs are being, program directors and programs are being judged by how much research output they produce during your res residency. So if you're a candidate coming in and you've had a few, one or two publications, it speaks well in the sense that you're going to continue that level of production of research throughout your training. So program directors are more likely to bring you in as an extra point because of your research. But that being said, research has to be geared, come from a place of interest. Don't just do random, in, random research and say, okay, have a storyline to your research. That way you're able to communicate and articulate oh, I did this research because I was interested in answering this question. And as a result of that, this is what we're able to add to the body of knowledge out there. So if you're able to articulate that way, the interviewer is more, oh, this, there's passion behind your research, you know? So. And I think as a student, honestly, I do. I sometimes felt that there was not a lot of time or opportunity for research. I mean, on the island, because but there, it's true that um, you know there are different kinds of research. So not all research is clinical, and even in residency, a lot of uh, research can be just from quality improvement or screening and population statistics. And um, I'm not sure if there's any projects like this going on on the island yet. But I, there it might seem that there's no research labs on bench research here that I know of. But there could be a possibility to start something that way if it's not already done. But I know that even when we were there, um, Dr. Nash, I believe, had a lot of um, anatomy lab findings, and they had a lot of publication just based on cadaver work. And uh, you know, you can any publication is 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 valid, you know, and if you're truly interested and, in, you know, and even in the UK, just like a case reports and stuff like that. So I had one in the pediatrics and I matched in internal medicine and I'm doing rheumatology and it was a pediatric infectious disease um, paper and I see Dr. Mickey's here. So, you know, those kinds of things that was really interesting and we talked uh, and I did that just through uh, my rotation time. It didn't take any extra work or anything like that because the, the resources are there if you're interested in them. But 
there is always room to add more, so just being creative about that. So if you have an interest, you can always try to see how to add that on maybe. But it's true that it can be challenging to find research opportunity that you're actually interested in, but they're out there, so. All right, thank you everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you for you, having uh, us. Thank, thank you for the questions. Let's give a big round of applause. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Kanal. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ofori. Very informative.